I'm Deborah Ackland. I'm the president and CEO of uh, WQED Multimedia, the public radio and television station, actually right here on Carnegie Mellon's um, campus. Um, would you do me a favor? Would you keep me on time? I actually did not write out remarks. I, I'm, I'm really more going to have a little bit of a conversation with you and tell you some stories that I think illustrate the subject tonight uh, very well. But first, I'd like to express my deep appreciation to uh, Commissioner Copps and to Congressman Doyle for their positions on this matter. Congressman Doyle is a great champion of public broadcasting, and that's just another way that he is a great champion of all of you. Uh, I'm a little bit of a student of this subject. I told you that I'm the president and CEO of WQED, and I'm also a veteran of KDKA here in town and also the National Geographic. And now that I know that we're being taped for PC, uh, for PC TV, I have to be a little careful about what I'm going to say. I have a tendency to, uh, to throw grenades, uh, but hopefully that will make some in for some interesting questions when the panel um, gets started. I have really strong feelings about this. I am a Pittsburgh native. I was born and raised in this community and educated in this community, and I have worked in this, uh, in this city in my hometown for 25 years. Uh, and I am also the first woman to run WQED. I followed an African-American president and CEO, the first African-American president and CEO uh, of WQED. So just in the last 17 years, I would say that WQED has been guided by minority and by female leadership. I do not own the station. You own the station station. It belongs to you. I'm simply a steward um, of that station. And I just wanted to tell you about local ownership. And uh, Matt referenced the fact that we're in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Fred Rogers told me a story one time, which I think really does illustrate uh, why we're here and why local media ownership is so important. He, as you know, came from Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And for a while, he moved to New York, and he was going to work on the Kate Smith Television Hour. Some of you may remember Kate Smith. And Fred told me that he uh, started actually wearing tennis shoes when he worked on that program because he was the floor manager and he didn't want his shoes to squeak on the floor. That was actually why he started wearing tennis shoes on the air. And he walked by a studio one day, another studio where another program was being filmed, probably live, and he saw on the monitor outside of the studio. Now this, is, this must have been 1950, 1951. Television went on the air in 49 in, en masse, so you can imagine it was really in its infancy. And he saw on that monitor, he saw someone get a pie in the face, a whipped cream pie in the face. And it stopped him cold. And he told me that he watched that and he thought to himself, is that all there is? Is that all this new miracle medium is going to be? Shtick. Slapstick. Very soon after that, he heard that the community in Pittsburgh was going to apply for an educational television license. He came back to Pittsburgh to help lead the charge on that. He was our first program director, and he started all of his children's programming there. He changed the world. Pittsburgh's gift to the media world is WQED and public broadcasting. We were here, we were licensed in 1954. 14 years later, PBS was organized. 14 years, WQED was one of the few voices in the wilderness really doing local work. And in that forming of PBS, there also was formed something called the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Corporation for Public Broadcasting is funded by Congress every year. Seems like a lot of money. It's minuscule. 400, about $440 million goes to cover every public television and radio station in the entire country. $440 million for all of these licenses, all of these communities. And they want to cut it all the time. It's about a dollar of your tax bill um, every year. 89% of that money by statute goes to local communities. It does not stick to Washington. It comes to Pittsburgh. It comes to Erie. It comes to Harrisburg. Uh, the way we were organized, Carnegie Mellon donated the land. The University of Pittsburgh donated the land for our broadcast tower. And Westinghouse Broadcasting put our tower up in the air. Community. Community television. So I also have my own Bill Burns experience, my own Bill Burns moment, where I went, wow, is that what this is going to be like? I had worked at KDKA TV, and I have to preface this by saying that there are some really wonderful people who work there, and I don't take anything away from the decisions that they have to make. But what they do is they work for a corporate master who makes value for shareholders, okay? Value for shareholders. That's the equation there. Uh, my own experience was I was a young producer. 
and I had an idea for a story. I saw something going on in my community, and I understood my community because I lived here, and I had an ownership in it. And I saw something happening where one hospital was sort of buying up all these community hospitals. See why I have to be careful tonight. <laughs> and I, so I proposed to, uh, to the news staff. I said, why don't we do a story on how Pittsburgh will eventually have two hospitals? And I was told I couldn't do that because they were advertised. Okay? Local ownership. I also, many years later when I started to move into management, that's when I really started to see the danger of mixing media and the profit motive in a way that is very different from what Congressman Doyle and Commissioner Cox are proposing. And that was when I was uh, in the big office and the, all the uh, muckety-mucks had come in from New York. And I had already had an experience where my compensation was tied to how many eyeballs I could attract to the 6 o'clock news or the 11 o'clock news. If I could attract a demographic, a male demographic 18 to 25, I could earn another $1,000 or whatever the case might be. I was tied to ratings. And in that meeting, consultants came in, and the consultant said, this consultant actually got down on his, on his knees and begged me to make a change in how we promoted our newscast. He said, you need to exploit your audience's fears. That is a direct quote. You need to exploit your audience's fears. He gave specific examples. You need to say your kids are using drugs, and you don't know it, so you have to watch tonight's parenting tips. You are three months away from losing your job and going bankrupt, so you better watch tonight's job tips. You're going to get cancer in your lifetime, so you better watch tonight's health team report. They are still doing it to you today. They're still doing it to you today. Now, I said earlier in the other room, I said that people are being drugged. People are being drugged by that. We prey on your fear. We get you to watch. We jack up the advertising rates, and that's the equation. That moment, when I was told to exploit my audience's fears, I actually found a backbone I didn't know I had. And I stood up, and I walked out of the office, and I went into my news director's office, and I said to her, she also was a Pittsburgh native, and I said to her, I can't do that. I won't do it. And if you need me to do that, then you need, me, you need to tell me that, and I'll go get another job. And two weeks later, WQED called me. Called me and offered me a job. I didn't go looking for it. They called me and offered me offered it to me. So I've got to say, there is no local ownership anymore. WQED is locally owned. You own it. Channel 2 is no longer locally owned. Channel 4 is no longer locally owned. Channel 11 is no longer locally owned. Most of the radio stations are from Clear Channel. What's the best way to control a community? Control the information. Have the information come from one source. It's a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing. So I hear about low-power radio, and some people say to me, ooh, low-power radio is coming to kill public radio. And my reaction is, that's okay. There really isn't such a thing in my world as, uh, as competition. Yes, you will always hear me fight for more money for public broadcasting. Yes, you will hear me fight for a larger share of taxpayer dollars. Let me tell you what public broadcasting does as it relates to localism. In 1968, when many communities were being lit up by the civil, race, by the civil rights um, situation and riots and a lot of misunderstanding, WQED put a program on the air called Black Horizons. That program is still on the air. 43 years later, it has never been sponsored. It has never been underwritten. It has always been supported by dollars that come from members, by dollars that come from this local community. This year, for the first time ever, the program that we used to call Black Horizons, that we now call Horizons, because it's about all of us, will broadcast its first entire episode in Spanish. That's what community-owned media does and should do. I'll tell you that, I'll give you one more thing, and then I'm, we'll sit down and we'll take your, your uh, questions. One more thing, which is a, a great um, equation that our program director, and no one has one job at WQED, he's also our cooking guy, Chris Fenimore says about the contract that we have with the public. And he describes it this way. He says, in commercial media, the contract is between the television station and the advertiser, and the audience is the deliverable. In public broadcasting, the contract is between the station and the audience, 
and the programming and the information is the deliverable. I leave you with that. I'm glad you're here. Thanks very much.